changes, right? In terms of, so this is exciting for me. So we are doing really well. We know from our last class, uh, Penoyer. We know the whole point of Penoyer, always here, is that, uh, you know, remember we talked about we had all of these changes, right? In terms of, um, you know, we had the creation of railroads were being laid down, so interstate commerce and corporations, the, the model of corporations was starting to be adopted uh, by a lot of um, people. And so it begins to cloud judgment in terms of when you have these cases before a judge or people having some type of legal conflict, um, what power, authority, uh, jurisdiction does the different states, do each individual state have over those people? Like, can I force someone from another state to come and defend themselves against a lawsuit? And if so, under what circumstances? So Penoyer was just like the first time the court said, you know what, we do need to create some type of rules or parameters. And all Penoyer said is there are two ways that you can have jurisdiction, a state, or what they call sovereignty, you can have jurisdiction over the person, right? One is presence. Are they present in the state? Did you serve them with notice of the lawsuit while they're physically present in the state? And the whole concept behind that is just the notion that if you're in our state boundaries, then you have jurisdiction over your person. If you're in our state, you're going to abide by our rules, and if we think there's been a wrong that's been committed that's related to the state, if we serve you with notice of that lawsuit while you're physically in the state of Kentucky, we can do that. The other one is domicile. Domicile means the same thing as residency. So later on this semester, we'll, we'll talk about kind of the formula for determining residency for linguists like myself. Um, but the point is, if you're domiciled in Kentucky, if I consider a Kentucky resident, um, I don't have to physically be in Kentucky to be served. They can serve me in Texas, Ohio, for a lawsuit against me here in Kentucky, where I'm domiciled where I live. Is anybody not clear on those two basic things? So are you wondering why I didn't just tell you that instead of having you read Penoyer? <laughs> I wouldn't have been a lot easier, right? Right, but I'm telling you, you interview for jobs, all the attorneys say, oh, what did you think about Penoyer? It's like a rite of passage. So it's like every law student in the country has to read Penoyer. It's kind of tradition. Um, and so where we are now with today's case, International Shoe, um, is finally they're like, okay, we need some more rules. And so what we're going to be doing over the next uh, semester, sorry, a couple of weeks, um, is to learn how the court, with each case, they give us another rule. So we know today the International Shoe, now they're going to give us a minimum context rule. So each case is going to give us a rule. And so when we're done with personal jurisdiction, we're going to have this beautiful map that says, to determine whether or not Kentucky has personal jurisdiction over Kentucky, these are the things we have to look at. And when you're out in practice, you're going to say, your client's going to say, well, I got this dispute, sorry about that, I got this dispute, and how do I check to make sure my alarms are off? Um, I have this dispute that, are there any more alarms? No. I have this dispute um, against someone who screwed me over on a contract in Indiana, no, it's too close, um, in New York, and you know, this is what's going on. You know, I'm a single business owner, you know, small business, 10 people. I don't have the funds or the time to fly back and forth in New York to try to hunt this guy down. And they're going to ask you, can you bring a lawsuit here in Kentucky? But as an attorney, you're going to have to decide whether you're doing employment law, um, patent law, whatever kind of law you're doing. Uh, tort law, you're going to have to be able to determine whether or not you can make that person in New York come to Kentucky for defend themselves or your client that's here in Kentucky. So that's why civil procedure is so important. You can't file a lawsuit unless you know what state you can file it in. If you pick the wrong state, the case is going to be dismissed. And, and that, that state's not going to have jurisdiction. So that whatever they, the judgment they made, it won't be binding, it won't be enforceable. So now you've wasted your billable hours, your time, your client's time, and money. And that's very, very bad. So that's why I just want you to know the class is kind of boring in the beginning, um, but it's very, very important. You can't practice law without civil procedure. Okay? All right. Um, so I'm going to try to keep track of time. I might mess myself up. I have a meeting with the uh, chair of the Department of Medicine, um, and I didn't know there. I heard it was the best voice downtown. So I'm trying to figure out how to not be late. It's a very important meeting. We're trying to do an uh, online collaboration, like a joint degree with the law school. So I decided I'm going to take an Uber. Because I figured by the time I walked in my car, get in the car, drive, park in the garage downtown, get there, I'm going to be screwed, right? Um, so I'm going to try to remember to let us out at like 10.05 so I have time to get there. But that's just planned. So if you see I've forgotten because I'm excited about the class, can you like wait for me? Okay. All right, let's shoot in. So we've got two attorneys today. Um, we know that uh, last that's great. Attorney Healy, high five again. And Rex Lobby, there you are. Excellent job. So today, let's get, um, let's, I like choose because I feel like it's nice to have a partner in crime, especially if you don't know the answer. Um, so let's do attorney, um, church, where are you? All right. You were targeted, so I like that. Okay. Um, attorney church, and we're preacher's kid. Um, we need some gender diversity. Um, line where are you? Awesome. All right. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and jump into International Shoe. Do I have a volunteer for either of you just to tell me uh, what the underlying facts speak is the case? case. So uh, International Shoe is a corporation based in Delaware, but they've got business in other states. Uh, this dispute starts with Washington State because they had 11 to 13 salesmen based in Washington, uh, but they didn't want to pay taxes to the uh, unemployment compensation fund. So Washington brings suit against them and uh, international shoes arguing that. Okay, hold that Okay, so this is that. You did a great job. Um, so, very great job. You're prepared. I'm liking you right now. Okay, so we know, um, very important fact, I just want to say it again, that you pointed out, it's important. Uh, where are they incorporated? Delaware. Delaware, principal place of business? St. Louis, Missouri. Louis, Missouri. Um, or Missouri, depending if you're from there. All right, that's important. <laughs> um, it's kind of like Louisville, Louisville, all that stuff. So, um, international shoe, as you did a great job pointing out, and it matters because we're going to talk about this in terms of minimal context. They had 11 to 13 salesmen, right? 11 to 13 uh, employed. Uh, 11 to 13 residents in the state of Washington to solicit orders there for their business. Um, they reported directly to the company's main office in St. Louis. It's also important. So who did they report to? Corporate headquarters in St. Louis. Um, so the state of Washington, um, as Attorney Church said, um, collected, oh, they sued International Shoe, basically trying to collect unemployment um, tax upon, based on the salaries that the defendant paid to their Washington employees. So if you're in the state of Washington, as Mr. Church did a great job saying, you don't want people freeloading in your state. You know, if, if you're working in my state and enjoying the benefits of my state, you need to pay unemployment taxes, state unemployment tax. So the state of Washington felt like International Shoe was trying to get over and not pay taxes that everyone else has to pay. Um, so how, um, attorney, got your last name, that quick line yeah. um, how did the state of Washington serve notice on the defendant? They served um, one of the employees that they had within the state, and they sent notice to the defendant's office. Excellent. So there's two ways. They did uh, service on the person, right? So one of their salesmen, a solicitor. And then second, they did service members called constructive service by mail um, to International Shoes corporate office in St. Louis, Missouri. Okay, so there's two different ways. Um, so you were getting, jumping into your attorney church. Um, the defendant International Shoes arguments as to why they should not have to pay this tax and why the state of Washington should go differently. Um, so they're basically three main arguments. What were they? Basically, they're not a corporation in Washington State. They're not doing business there. They're not doing business in the state. Um, so, when you say they had no agent in the state, how does that relate to Penoyer? I mean, what rule was Penoyer
All right, so excellent. So three, I'm going to highlight the three rules uh, that Attorney Church um, highlighted in uh, now we have co counsel because I can't read your name. It starts with an H, right? Harvard. 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 My writing is too scratch. Um, I don't know, it looks like physicians, right? Just your last name, though. Okay, so we got three main arguments. So your international shoe, this is what you're telling the judge. Number one, um, you got the service of process on the sales argument, all right? So you got the service of process on the sales argument. Um, a salesman or sales solicitor is not the appropriate person for service. Why? Because the salesman authority is limited. All they do is show samples, take orders, you know, buyers. They don't have any authority to enter contracts, they don't have any authority to make collections. So essentially, what the international shoe is saying, you can't just do service of process on one of our salesmen. And think about how problematic that is. Think about that just for a minute. You serve, imagine you serve process on a Domino's pizza delivery guy. And he hates his job. He's like, I'm just doing this so I find something else. My boss sucks. Domino's sucks. You know, and you think if you serve process, you know, what's the likelihood it's going to get to the right people up the chain, right? Because it's, it's pretty slim. You know, you might. Um, but the point is, that's the argument the international shoe is making. And so the sales, basically, sales may transmit orders to the defendant's office again in St. Louis, Missouri at their headquarters. Um, and so essentially, what they're saying is that, you know, if you're going to start process, you know, it shouldn't be on our salesman. That's not a legitimate way to provide us with notice. That does not fulfill the 14th and 5th Amendment due process requirements. Fairness. Like, that's not fair if you serve it on our solicitor. The second argument they highlight activities within the state. They say, as, as Attorney Church said, Hey, our activities in the state of Washington are not sufficient enough to confer jurisdiction on us. We're not really in Washington, right? They said, you know, we don't have an office in Washington. We don't have any contacts for sale or purchase. Um, we don't have stock or merchandise in Washington. So essentially, what they're saying is, we are not an employer based on the definition of employer in your in your statute that says we have to pay unemployment taxes. We're not. We don't. We're not. We don't have enough activities there for you to make us pay like the other employers. And then the third argument is no presence in the state, which is what Jessica was highlighting, right? Attorney Harper. Since uh, international shoe is essentially saying, since we're not present present in the state, it's a denial of due process to subject us to taxation. How are you going to make us pay a tax if we're not even present in the state? You can't do that. Right? So that's their argument. So how does the lower court rule attorney argument? What do they say? They come from Washington. Excellent. Uh, so they, they said that there was personal jurisdiction or not personal jurisdiction over the defendant. Excellent. Okay. So we know that the Supreme Court in the state of Washington said, mm, we're going to agree with the state of Washington, and yes, we do have personal jurisdiction over the international shoe. Pay the tax. All right. What does the Supreme Court say in front of Washington? They also affirm the state of Washington. Excellent. So the uh, Supreme Court says, hey, we're not going to overrule that. We agree as well. And so, um, Essentially, um, I think it's important to just take a moment and compare this case to the Pennoyer case that we just read, right? We know the international shoe isn't a resident of Washington. We know that it's incorporated in Delaware and has its principal place of business in Missouri. International shoe is not having property in Washington, right? So they don't have any property in Washington. So the court, if they would have had property in Washington, then what could the court do? What, what could they have done with that property to confer jurisdiction, Attorney Harper? Um, yeah, what kind of jurisdiction is that called? Territorial jurisdiction? Uh, in rem. Well, quasi in rem, right? But that wasn't an option here. International shoe didn't have any property um, in Washington. And thank you. I hate reading upside down. I can't even tell you, great job. Thank you. Attorney Lamb? Where's Attorney Lamb? Nope. No, I'm running for our attorney for the day, so it's cold. Thank you for, I'm going to get you next time. I can see your face. <laughs> Alright, I will not take that personally. I'm cool with that. So we know under Panera, Panera, the other thing is presence, right? If we were thinking about this case in terms of Neuer. Um, if you look at the second paragraph on page 83 of your case, second paragraph on page 83. It says, quote, historically, the jurisdiction of courts to render judgment in quotanum is grounded on their de facto power over the defendant's person. Hence, his presence within the territorial jurisdiction, which just means the state, of a court was a prerequisite to his rendition of a final judgment binding on him. So the Pinoy argument that international shoe was making is simply that um, they had no corporate presence, right, in the state. Um, they basically were saying that the solicitation or activities done by the salesman was not sufficient enough to count. And so no personal jurisdiction, and they shouldn't be subjected to a tax. Um, so this has kind of put the court in a sticky situation because, truth be told, if we strictly apply Pinoy, they don't have jurisdiction. You know, they don't have, they're not present in the state. They're not domiciling other, their personal place of business is not in the state of Washington. So so surprisingly, what does the court do? What do they do? Attorney Hirsch. They rule that uh, even if they don't have access to one thing, they have more than one access to the law. Excellent. So this is a big deal. They crafted a new rule. They're like, you know what? Yes, if we were to apply Pinoyer, there would be no jurisdiction, but this isn't fair. So they said, you know, we're going to create a new rule. And that's essentially um, what they did. Um, they, the court stated in the second paragraph, page 83, um, I think it's paragraph, the sixth sentence, hopefully that's right, but I know the second paragraph, page 83, they say, quote, due process requires only that in order to subject a defendant to a judgment in personam, if he be not present within the territory of the forum, we have certain minimal contacts, as Attorney Church said, with it, such that the maintenance of the suit does not offend traditional notions of fair play and substantial justice. So in other words, a two-part test you must look at is, one, you look at the quality and nature of the defendant's activities. This is very important. I can absolutely promise and guarantee you every civil procedure professor in the country is going to test you on the international shoe rule, because you have to use it in practice. So you need to know the two parts of the rule. So again, uh, two-part test of the international shoe rule. The first component is you look at the quality and nature of the defendant's activities. Or students will typically put in parentheses minimum contacts, right? With the quality and nature of the defendant's activities, simply meaning there must be minimum contacts. How do we feel about that first problem? You see fair? You see any problems with it? Yes. Um, it could be I could be subjective. Yeah. So. Right. What's minimum? <coughs> One, two, three contacts, four contacts. How do you determine minimum contacts? That's kind of scary. If you're up, that's determined about to come to New York and defend myself, right? Ariana Grande saying, "Oh God, I need you to give me a number." Why do you think the court didn't say you have to have ten contacts or more, fifteen contacts or more? Yes. Can you depend on the size of the corporation? Size? What other considerations do you think of? Yes, your head. Companies would circumvent the rule if there was a hard, hard line. Yes, companies would circumvent the rule. They figure out a loophole. Oh, we, you know, we'll figure out. We'll do nine contacts, right? Um, but there's also the flip side of that. Is now I'm at, the, I'm at the mercy of a judge and his opinion on whether or not there's minimum contacts. So that's the good thing about it is to make sure that we always have jobs. <laughs> it's just up to the attorney to make that compelling moving argument, that LA law argument, or whatever they call it. Let's say that law and order argument to convince the judge um, that there is indeed minimum contact. Okay, so we know international shoe two part test. The first one, you look at the quality and nature of the defendant's activities. I'm just saying it again, meaning are there minimum contacts? And the second, um
So what's interesting about this is that what we'll see is within, as we move on with other cases, they'll say, they'll try to apply this, this international shoe rule and they'll realize fair? That's like, what's justice versus fair? Remember we did that at the beginning? Justice. It's fair is if you want to talk subjective. And so there is another case we'll cover where the court says, okay, we recognize this is too ambiguous, so these are the factors we look at to determine fairness. So, you know, it'll just keep, that's why I'm saying it's a puzzle, personal jurisdiction, they'll keep adding pieces and helping us see the overall framework. Okay, so we know they crafted this two-part rule. Um, the emphasis, emphasis on fairness um, is a really big shift uh, from Pennoyer, which turned on issues of state sovereignty, state control over people within their presence, um, not whether or not it was fair to be independent independent. Pennoyer could care less about fairness, right? So um, the court actually didn't examine fairness at all in Pennoyer. So this is a paradigm shift we see occurring in the court system. So what does it mean for a corporation then to be present, right, to permit the exercise of personal jurisdiction under the new international shoe test? In other words, how do you evaluate minimum contacts? Um, if you look at the last two paragraphs on page 83, the court suggests two principal things. Again, in terms of how you actually evaluate minimum contacts, the court suggests two principal things in the last two paragraphs on page 83. One, they tell you to look at the extent of the activities. I mean, are they continuous and systematic as opposed to casual or isolated? So again, the court says, you know, here are two principal things you should look at to determine whether there are minimum contacts. First, the extent of the activities. Are they continuous and systematic as opposed to casual or isolated? Are they continuous and systematic? Okay. <laughs> um, and then second, they can look at the relatedness of the activities to the cause of action. Relatedness, I'll explain what that means, of the activities to the cause of action. The relatedness of the activities to the cause of action. No, this is one last one. So you look at the relatedness of activities to the cause of action. So basically you look at whether or not there's a causal connection between the lawsuit or the legal dispute and the defendant's activities within that state. So are international shoes activities in that state selling stuff related to the lawsuit? F. They're saying your activities in the state require you to pay unemployment tax if you're not paying. So you look at the relatedness of the activities, right? The relatedness of the activities to the cause of action. So the point I just made helps you distinguish between specific jurisdiction and general jurisdiction. So here's what we know so far, brilliant scholars, right? We know that to file a case in civil court, we need what? We need, yeah, we need jurisdiction. And how do you determine if there's jurisdiction? Need, what type of jurisdiction do you need? Maybe that's the best better way to ask. Personal and in there. Personal, personal jurisdiction, right? I mean, it's not a trick. So <laughs> file a case in civil court, we know you need personal jurisdiction, which is what we're discussing now. We know you need subject matter jurisdiction, right down the first day of class. We know that you need venue. We know you need proper service of process. So, you know, we need all these things at once. So right now we're just discussing this one requirement, right? And so we know there's different types of jurisdiction. Someone said blase in room, right? A personal jurisdiction in room we've learned about. And now we just learned about specific jurisdiction. So there's specific jurisdiction and general jurisdiction. So what's going to happen in the semester? You're going to have several different types of personal jurisdiction, pathways to achieving personal jurisdiction, to establishing personal jurisdiction. So um, in your text today's reading, um, they distinguish, distinguish between specific um, and general jurisdiction, which again are types of personal jurisdiction. So make sure I'm clear about that. Um, if you, it's actually described on page 88, to make sure I'm the page down of your text. Um, and I encourage you to feel a star about that and look at it later. So general jurisdiction is where the cause of action um, arises from dealings entirely distinct from the corporation or the defendant's activities within the state. So again, general jurisdiction, which is described in your text, um, occurs where there's the cause of action arises from dealings, the cause of action arises from dealings entirely distinct from the corporation, entirely distinct from the corporation or the defendant's activities within the state. One more time. General jurisdiction is where the cause of action arises from dealings entirely distinct from the corporation or the defendant's activities within the state. We will spend an entire week looking at cases where there is general jurisdiction, so you know what that looks like, okay? Entire week on that. Um, the test to determine whether there is general jurisdiction is whether the defendant's contacts are substantial enough. Do you see the difference? Specific jurisdiction requires minimum contacts, which is a lower bar. General jurisdiction is a higher bar. You gotta have substantial contacts. So again, uh, the way to determine if there's general jurisdiction is if the defendant's contacts within the state are substantial enough, right, such that the case can be brought against the defendant, even if the case is unrelated to the defendant's activities within that state. So essentially what they're saying is we don't care if the case is a breach of contract and you, it has nothing to do with your activities within the state. If your contacts within the state of Kentucky are substantial enough, basically we can see you for anything, okay? So again, the way to determine general jurisdiction is if the defendant's contacts with the state are substantial enough such that the case can be brought against the defendant, even if the case is unrelated to the defendant's activities within the state. Um, they use an example on that page, that 88 page reference I made, they use basically the Microsoft Corporation, um, has its chief place of business in Washington State, um, and Microsoft can be sued in Washington even over contracts and torts committed in Idaho or Texas, because they have substantial contacts in that state. So if I have an issue with Microsoft or Amazon, and I want to go, I can go to their headquarters, if I can't figure out I have jurisdiction here in Kentucky, I can always sue them where their principal place of business is. And that's fair, we don't want corporations, as you said, uh, to try to evade process or try to, you know, game the system. So I think that's fair, we, we agree hopefully, right? All right, um, specific jurisdiction. So specific jurisdiction then is when the activities of the corporation are the basis of the lawsuit. So again, the activities of the corporation are the basis of the lawsuit. So you see the distinction. It doesn't matter with general jurisdiction if the, the activities don't have to be related to the lawsuit. But specific jurisdiction requires that the defendant's activities in that state are related to the lawsuit. Okay. So again, specific jurisdiction, jurisdiction is when activities of the corporation are the basis of the lawsuit. And when I repeat it a million times, it's for people that are handwriting, because they can't, I just have to shake hands. So it's not that I think it's slow. You wouldn't be here if you were very bright to see this. All right, um, 932, I have a question. Side note. Um, have you all seen the um, support animals that people are allowed to have? Mm -hmm. Right, those two stores. So I was on a plane last week, and somebody had a squirrel. <laughs> and at first I'm like, oh, how cute, right? And it's one of the things where there's just two in A and B row. I was like, oh, so cute. 
was like, hi, Swirl, you know, you don't need it, right? And I was like, oh. Um, and so, like, the whole plane ride, my heart was like this. I'm like, he's gonna, like, if I take the car's tires, I'm not gonna take it down. He's like, you know, he's gonna, like, swirl me for life. This little guy's out of control. But yeah, he was, like, really, he was, like, cute, cuddly squirrel. He was, like, a kid touch. He was, like, a little squirrel with, like, a uh, chihuahua spirit in it. Like, just a little spicer. And so I was thinking, like, should they have limits? And Laura Rusty would kill me for saying this. Should they have limits on what types of support animals you can bring on plane? I thought they do. We did a whole time. Why okay. <laughs> like, squirrel now? Because we're trying to like, squirrel. I thought you were having a major horse. Like, 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 are you serious? Well, I'm here saying a, a miniature horse? That's not true. I want to get back to like, they said that was one of like, the two official ones. I'm not sure. For the people that were allergic to dogs. Yeah, no way. I haven't seen a miniature horse. But this was a squirrel. This was last week. And I'm still like, I'm still traumatized. But I was like, I feel like, you know, this is me being dramatic. But I feel like I'm being exposed to trauma. And I feel like I'm playing right. But I feel like anymore. And part of what I think influenced me is there's a guy, if you Google it, it's American Airlines, but this guy was mauled by a dog. It was a support dog. And he was in the window seat. And the dog actually mauled him. Like he had to, like half his face, like he ripped his face. Like he had, like his face was permanently deformed. And I was upset about that. And I think, I think that story's always stuck with me. So when squirrel, then I was like, he's gonna totally take my face out. So right. out of the cage? Yeah, she had him in the cage. He was sitting in his lap. And I was like, no. Okay, not good. Yeah. So sometimes this material can get really dust dense. So I will share my crazy life stories just because I don't want you to be bored. Because I hate being bored. And that's a real story. And I just thought I'd share. Yeah. So who can tell me, before I move on, to see how quickly you retain information, um, difference between specific and general jurisdiction? Besides, yes. Um, specific has to deal with the defense activities in the state, and general does not. Excellent. All right. Moving on. For general, you need what level of contract? Uh, substantial. Excellent. You know, of course, anything with law, that's going to change later, too. Just like the more you change, done. Yeah, so. Okay. That's why with this class, like, if you don't read and get behind, you won't understand, like, how everything fits together. And you'll be like, oh, Kenoria's still, no, it's not. Kenoria's not the law anymore. But it's, it's everything, they're building blocks. And that's why I have to be kind of anal about the game here. Because it's really like catch-up. It's not like work. All right. Um, so when the defendant's activities fall short of general jurisdiction, uh, what you would do as an attorney is say, okay, well, they don't have substantial contact in the state. Let me see if they have minimum contact. Maybe I can get a case filed there through specific jurisdiction. So we apply this two-part test, uh, minimum contact test, uh, attorney Weinweber, um, to the facts of the international shoe. Um, are there sufficient minimum contacts? And if so, how do we determine that? And that's because uh, they have the ability to the state um, working in their apologies to their other What else? They were being paid salaries. Yeah, being paid salaries. Um, anything else you see in the facts? Well, they were going to the rights of the state, so they, they have the right to dispute within the state. It's going to move on to them. So and that's what the court says. So in some cases, um, they're not qualified to minimum contact. Excellent. When you say they're enjoying the rights of the state, do you know what the court is referencing? They don't really specifically spell out. What do you think they have by it? Well, the case against them, if they want to do it against someone else. Yeah, and another thing we'll see when we read some more cases when they say they're enjoying the rights of the state, they're saying, look, when you're in the state of Kentucky, you can at any point in time dial 911, you have the protection of our uh, policing service, our you know, our medical service, hospitals, you're driving on our roads, you know, like you're enjoying the benefits of being in the state of Kentucky. And sometimes there's some responsibilities or, um, what's a better word? Privileges. Privileges, thank you, that are attached. Thank you very much, are attached to um, being present in that particular state. Okay, so we know that, um, you know, determining whether or not there's sufficient contact, I'm just gonna repeat what Attorney Weinweber said, everything she said was correct. Uh, she just waved in the back <laughs> so that the people inside can hear. Um, so yes, there are lots of activities. If you look at the facts, which is what you would be out in the real world, um, 11 to 13, as Attorney uh, Church said earlier, um, in-state salesmen are residing in Washington, uh, regularly selling shoes in Washington. Um, even if they're supervised from uh, Missouri, uh, the salesman generated $31,000. That's pretty significant back then, if you look at the case being dated, um, in commissions from shoe sales, uh, plus the defendant gives uh, salespeople um, samples and pays for rental space um, in the state of Washington. Um, so the court basically says that these activities count as systematic and continuous. Um, plus there's a large volume uh, of set of interstate business. Um, the defendant received, again, the benefits and protections of the state, um, as I was just discussing with Attorney Lineweaver. Um, and more important, for specific jurisdiction, uh, this lawsuit arose out of those, that defendant's activities within the state. Um, but what about the second prong? Because remember, there's two, fairness, right? It has to be fair to force this non-resident defendant um, to come and defend themselves in the state of Washington. Um, the court says, what about that uh, attorney church? Does they, do they say that personal jurisdiction would be fair? Why or why not? They say it wouldn't be fair. Uh, because they, uh, as you can, have the activities of the state. Um, somewhat, yes. Um, if you, can you tell me where on the uh, page 84, second last paragraph, is there anything there to support what you think? It's evident. It is evident that these operations established the ties with the state, one to make it reasonable and just according to our traditional conception of fair play and standard justice. You permit the state to enforce the obligations to which a client has to pay Excellent. All right. So, is there personal jurisdiction in this case? Obviously, the answer is yes. Um, is there a specific jurisdiction or general jurisdiction? I've said the answer already, but what is that? Attorney Lineweaver. Um, whether there's specific or general jurisdiction? Yeah, excellent. All right. Because because they've been in contact with Yes, but why? Why is there a specific versus general jurisdiction? I want you to say it so that you don't put it down. Okay, yeah, so we know there's no substantial contacts. And what is what what is unique about the type of lawsuit that is qualified for specific jurisdiction? Um, yeah, what is unique about the type of lawsuit that uh, qualifies for specific jurisdiction? What type of lawsuit? What what has to be what connection do you need? You know this? I'm trying to figure out how to ask without telling you the answer, but I know you know the answer. Dude. So tell me um, what type of lawsuit if you don't talk about contacts, um, general jurisdiction, I can bring any type of lawsuit, right? Against yeah. yeah, because they have substantial contacts in the state. So for specific jurisdiction, in addition to having minimum contacts, what's the other requirement? Perfect. Told you. Know. All right. So the case has to arise out of the defendant's activities within the state. So, all right. Um, any questions about the only time I say no questions is Penoria because it freaks everybody out. But we're back in regular class mode. Any questions about international shoe? Do you understand international shoe? Yeah, I think I get it. Or I do get it. But okay. so now, like Amazon or something, they, they wouldn't send a sales and they just have the website, right? So they can do business in Washington. Yeah. So we'll have a whole case on how do you determine uh, jurisdiction for <laughs> online entities. There's a sliding test that you use, a sliding scale. Um, so in a future class, but for now, based on Amazon, it's, this is too premature to address that. Which is why they had to create another one. This is before the state of before the internet was here. All right. Um, let's go ahead.